everyone. I think I don't need a microphone. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm Brendan Kessich. I'm a professor of mathematics at Brown, and I'm also the director of ICERM. ICERM is the Institute for Computational and Experimental Research in Mathematics. Our main funding comes from the National Science Foundation. We also get funding from the Simon Foundation. We get a lot of support from Brown University and from many individual and institutional sponsors. Thank you for coming tonight. ICERM's mission is to bring people together to talk about mathematics, to collaborate, to, to, to share the ideas that they have, and to build communities around topics like polytopal geometry, which we have a program right now running on. And so we have people coming from all over the world in order to, to, to do things in a community that they couldn't do with at home in their own institutions. Um, and so we're, we're very proud to have visitors coming um, during the semesters and during the summers to do all different kinds of mathematics. Our focus is on areas of the mathematical sciences that interact with computation, where computational experiments can inform discovery, where you can do something cool on the computer and find something new that you wouldn't expect, but also with mathematical ideas can help develop new algorithms, develop new computational tools that can benefit society. So that feedback is where our focus is. Um, so I talked enough about ICERM. I should talk about Jesus. So right. we're really pleased to have Jesus giving the lecture tonight. He's originally from Mexico City, and he did his undergraduate work there before coming to the United States for his, his graduate work. He has a master's degree from Western Michigan and a doctorate degree from Cornell. He's been at Davis since 1999. Um, That's a long-serving long faculty member. He's done amazing things at Davis. He's um, supervised, and this is probably dated, but 15 PhD students in Austin. 17. 17. 17. <laughs> I, sh I should have gotten 60 undergraduate students. Um, he's won awards for mentoring across the gamut. He, you know, he has served as chair of his department during COVID. There has to be some special medal for doing that job under those circumstances. Um, he's done lots of university service as well. He's a wonderful and inspiring scholar. I'm an algebraic geometer. I live in the pure math world, and I've been watching over the last 30 years as we've become connected to algebraic, to, to apply mathematics and algebraic geometry. So I've seen the applied communities come closer and closer, and I've seen my field change for the better. And one of the people who is leading the, leading the flag is Jesus. He's helped us become more connected, and he's brought important new ideas that have informed both the things that I do, but also, I think, helped um, help new, new computational tools develop. He's written or edited two very influential books, one on triangulations and one on algebraic and geometric ideas and the theory of discrete optimization. The program he's leading here is on discrete optimization, and so we're really pleased to have his leadership. He is a leader at the national level in the mathematical community. Um, in his spare time, he's vice president of the American Mathematical Society. Um, he served on our scientific advisory board and on advisory boards of institutes around the country. Uh, in his role on our scientific advisory board, he, he was formative in helping develop this program. I could probably give my whole introductions on just the things he's done for ICER uh, because his, his contributions are so immense. He's won many awards for his work. He's a fellow of both the American Mathematical Society and the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, one of the real leaders in the national community. And so we're really lucky to have him speak today about a path through mathematics and how he will make. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to talk to you. My job in the next 50 something minutes is to keep you entertained and adoring mathematics. That's my plan. So uh, as you see in, in the picture, my, the main story will be about polyhedra and I will talk to you about these objects for 50 minutes. But I would like to start by acknowledging the fact that we are privileged in this room because we like mathematics. Or, or at least I hope you like mathematics and that's why you came here. Uh, I mean, at least you like mathematics enough to come here, to have come to this lecture. So I imagine that uh, you maybe don't have these feelings that you can see in this, in this picture. For example, there's this little monster that is destroying mathematics. I don't know if you see here. Yeah, the, the little monster really hates math. 
And then there's people that find that math is confusing, right? Like, for example, you can see here uh, how people think about math world problems, right? You know, they, I don't, I'm not going to read it, but you can see that this is a little bit crazy. There's no really coherent. And I actually feel that, uh, well, I mean, this is, this is very unfortunate. I disagree that this, is, this has to be this way. Uh, there's another reaction that I, that I want to point out here. Um, you know, there's this person saying, well, whatever I learned in school in math was useless. And I, I would like to, to say that to me, the reaction I have when I see this, uh, some people fear mathematics, some people uh, distrust mathematics or feel there is a useless thing. I feel that we need to defend math. I mean, we really need to defend mathematics, especially with the uh, leaders, I mean, the political leaders or decision makers, because it's the future. And another thing I want to say is that often, you know, I'm in a taxi and, you know, the taxi driver is very friendly. They ask you, what do you do? I'm a math professor. So what, the f what do you think is the first reaction? I was very bad at math, right? You know, I was bad. They, they, it's like people apologize. They, they don't, they, it's, it's, uh, it's a typical reaction. Or, oh, I hated math. Or I was afraid of math. And, and if you think about it, there was, I believe that there must have been somebody in your life that made you like mathematics. I mean, you must have had a, a parent or a teacher that made you like math somehow. I mean, I, I still remember, in my case, who it was. I can tell you later. Anyway, so often, you know, somebody asks me, you're a math professor, so you teach, right? Yes, but what else do you do, right? Is that, that's all you do. No, 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 no. We are paid to, to do research. Research. And people don't have any idea whatsoever of the kinds of research that a mathematician will do. So I have collected in this presentation, I have a, a, a sample of very, very easy to present problems that I can guarantee you some of them you can present it to children in elementary school because I have done that and they understand the problem. And uh, even the fa most famous mathematicians in, in the world do not know the answer for these questions. Okay, so that's my job to show you that mathematics is alive. It's, a, it's very much, there's many more mathematics than calculus. That's one first message I want to say. If you think you know every math everything in mathematics because you took calculus in college, no, that's not true. All right, so I'm gonna start telling you several open questions. And um, you know, feel free to ask me questions. I mean, let's, let's try to um, engage if you, if you have an, any comments or questions. The, um, the thing is that I will switch topics very often. So if you didn't understand something, you can wake up again every, let's say, every 10 minutes. <laughs> so so let's, tr let's try to keep you awake, all right? So the first topic. I'm going to try to tell you, for, I mean, first of all, I'm talking about convex polyhedra, pl the plural of convex polyhedron. And I also talk about convex polytopes. So I need to tell you what I mean by that. OK? So let's start. When you tell, a, tell somebody what is a cat, you show them pictures of cats. So here are some pictures of, of polyhedra or polytopes. In this case, actually, these are polyhedra. There are polytopes. You will see why. Um, Anyway, so let's see, let's, there are some more. Ah, actually, this is a very nice uh, picture of some polytopes that appear in nature. I mean, you can see, I, I don't remember actually wh where. I think this is in the coast of uh, Ireland. So, thank you. Yeah, so yeah, this, these pictures, uh, I, I, and actually, this one is uh, in, in the US. Um, David, Devil Postpile or something? I forgot the name of the, of the national park. But you can see in all these natural formations, for example, here you can see some polygo polygonal shapes that are you know, like prism type shapes, right? So polytopes appear in nature, right? Polytopes appear in nature. Um, yeah, here's another example of a polytope. Uh, well, not the, not the thing with hair. <laughs> and, I, and I brought one, one of my toys for, for this presentation to try to explain what they are. So, but I'm not going to talk about these polytopes. I mean, some of you, if you, uh, I mean, I know there are people that like, that like these subjects very much already. 
this is a very popular type of polytopes, but I'm not going to talk about these. The ones that I'm going to talk about, they have to be convex. They have to be round. Um, so the, what's a convex set? It's one of the most important concepts in computational mathematics. Many of my colleagues are here, and they will agree with me, hopefully. So what's a convex set? Is a convex set is a, an object that if you pick any pair of points, you know, I pick these two points, and I connect them with a, with a straight, line, uh, straight line segment, that has to be completely inside the set. So this is a, this is a convex set here on, on, on the right. And this is not a convex set. This banana shape is not convex because you know, I have this point and this point. And if I join the line segment, it goes outside the set. Is everybody clear? So my objects have to be roundish like this. They have to be convex. So for example, when I talk about convex polytopes, it's all the points inside the object, right? including the boundary, not just the skeleton. I'm just showing you kind of the skeleton of the thing. Everybody's? Happy so far? All right. Yeah, so the most, the most simple kind of convex set you obtain by, I have a plane, and I cut space with a plane. In the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the dimension two, a line will divide the two-dimensional plane in, in, two, in two pieces, right? In this room, we're in three dimensions, so you, and any wall, I mean, will divide the space into two pieces, right? And so on. So when you have a hyperplane, so imagine now you're in many dimensions, something like this will happen, that you have the plane, and it will divide in two pieces, the space. And this is what I call a half space. That's a half space. And you can see that half spaces are convex, in some sense. Um, and then I can finally come to the definition. Uh, this is a correct mathematical definition of what I, the objects that I'm talking about today. For me, uh, every half space is an equation. So that if you are familiar with analytic geometry, maybe in high school you learned that every geometric object, like a circle, has an equation. So the objects that we study tonight they come with a system of, of several inequalities. So it's not an equation equal to something, but it's less than or equal here. So each of them gives me a half space. I have divided the space and say everything that is above this plane is in the set. And I take the intersection of all of those, and that's the object that I study. Okay? So that's what I call a polyhedron. Now, if in addition, the, um, the set is fits on a box, like in this case, if this fits on a box, I call that a polytope. A polytope. OK? So let me repeat it one more time. So this, the objects that I'm studying have a geometric view. But there, for applied mathematicians, it's important to have equations that describe them. And the description is coming from these systems of linear equations. If any of you has taken in college linear algebra, this is kind of the next level of linear algebra, in, in a way. Everybody so far so good, okay, hopefully. OK. So well, if you look at these beautiful objects, they come in pieces, right? They, they're kind of made. For example, this object here has pentagons. You see everybody. It's a, this is called a dodecahedron. That's the name of this object. And they come pentagonal faces everywhere, right? They are glued together. And, uh, and they make, they make a, uh, the polytope. This is a polytope. Now, the polytope this is made of pieces. And these pieces, are, I'm going to call them faces. So what's a face? A face is I have my polytope. And I come with a plane. And it touches the polytope in some, in some uh, object. And that is a face. So for example, here, if I come like this, I have a face, which is an, a one-dimensional face. It's just a segment. Or if I come like this, it will be a, a face of zero dimensional, because it's just one point. OK? So faces, uh, here are more examples. I can show, I'm showing you more, more examples. In this, this pyramid, the, the face is a hexagon, because the plane is touching on the hexagon. Like here, if I, if I do this, it's a plane that touches on a pentagon, and so on. Yeah, everybody's with me? And there are. Zero dimensional faces, which are the corners. Zero dimensional faces are the corners, the vertices. One dimensional faces are the, these, these edges. And then I have the two dimensional faces that are the pentagons in this example. 
Everybody with me? Now we're going to do counting of faces. How many faces are there on these polytopes? And I want to start with some of the classical things that happen counting faces. This gentleman that I'm showing here is uh, the famous Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler. He worked in mathematics in the 1700s, and he discovered one remarkable formula that has to do with the number of faces on polytopes, on, on polytopes like this one. So what we are going to do is we're going to call F0 is the number of vertices, the number of zero dimensional faces. F1 is the number of one dimensional faces. And F2 is the number of two dimensional faces. And in general, when we go, when we go into higher dimension, well, there's going to be faces of higher dimension. So this is Fi counts the number of faces of that dimension. All right? So that's the, and now let's do an experiment. So let's see, um, here is, here is, uh, uh, here are some pictures of some famous polytopes that are the platonic solids. So let's see. For example, let's take the let's take the cube here. Here's the cube. So let's see how many how many zero dimensional faces. Any volunteers? How many zero dimensional faces we have? Eight. Thank you. So I'm gonna start writing them here. Eight. How many one dimensional faces? Twelve. And two-dimensional faces, this might be a tricky question because the way I drew, I made the picture. Six. Why six? Well, you only see, maybe you say, well, there's five, no? No, there's six because there's, I mean, there's one, two, three, four, five, but there's the back of the cube. I'm just flattening the cube for you, right? Everybody agrees there's six? Yes? Okay, now look at the equation on top. So I have eight minus 12 plus 6, that is equal to 2. So that, that, that is the equation. And if you repeat this for every three-dimensional polytope, you repeat this for every three-dimensional polytope. I mean, for example, it's the dodecahedron. Here's the dodecahedron. It's right here. So you can see 20 minus 30 plus 12, that is 2. Yeah? So this is always 2. No matter how you do it, you will always get two. Everybody's with me? So this, this is always true. This is what mathematicians like to call a theorem, right? So we like to, to say things that are always true no matter when you, no matter what you look at. So this is the famous Euler's formula. And um, yeah, so Euler discovered that this is necessary. You, you need. If you give me a, a sequence of integer numbers, like uh, 10, 10, 10, that's not going to be, that's not going to be the, the, the sequence of zero dimensional faces, one dimensional faces, and two dimensional faces, because it doesn't add up to two. Yes, everybody see that? So it's a, it's a very important formula. It's a very, very important formula. So Euler, in 1700s, he asked the question, can somebody please, uh, characterize all the vectors f0, f1, f3, f2. So these are vectors with three entries, just three numbers that come from some three-dimensional polyhedron. Is the question clear? So Euler had this question. Can somebody just tell me when is this going to be the true? OK. OK, so fast forward about 200 years. And this, this is another Swiss mathematician, I guess. Swiss like these questions. Uh, he's, he's, uh, this is uh, Steinitz. Steinitz, in 1906, discovered the following remarkable theorem, or result in mathematical knowledge, that every vector that comes from some three-dimensional polytope has to satisfy these three conditions, these three conditions. So the first one is Euler's equation. The first one is Euler's equation. And the other two, you will see they're somewhat natural, somewhat natural. Uh, but the point is the following. You, if you find a, a vector, any vector you think of a vector, like 10, 10, 10, you plug it into these equations. If, if it doesn't satisfy these three equations, then it's not coming from a polytope. But the other way around is also true. Every, every vector that satisfies these equations comes 
from a polytope, from a three-dimensional polytope. Yeah? So it's a complete answer that took 200 years to find, and, uh, and we, we know the answers. So let me explain briefly, very briefly, why this equation actually comes about. Well, this counts, it says that three times the number of vertices, the three times the number of corners, has to be less than two times the number of edges, the, the number of things that you have here. Well, the reason this is correct is because if at every vertex, you know, every one of the corners, I'm going to have at least three, three of these edges coming in. There cannot be less because otherwise it will not define a vertex, right? So that means that when you take the sum of the number of edges that touch a particular vertex, so let's call that delta E, delta I, uh, so this has to be, uh, this is equal to the number of edges but counted twice because every vertex, you, uh, every edge is, is touching two vertices. So every, every edge is counted twice. So that's equal to 2 times F1. But this other number is at least, oops, sorry. This other number is at least uh, three times the number of vertices. Oops, sorry. Uh, so this is three times F0. I mean, that's the idea. I, I can talk to you later about, about this. Uh, this is a proof. This is the only proof I'm going to do in my, in my talk, I promise. So OK, but the point of my first half of my lecture, first part of my lecture was a propo to propose an open question to you that nobody knows the answer. Even the famous experts don't know the answer for this. And this is the following. Euler proposed his question for three dimensions, and f we figured, I mean, Steinitz and figured it out 200 years later. So it's natural to ask, how about four dimensions? Can we characterize all the vectors f0, f1, f2, f3 that come from four dimensional polytopes? That's the question. So let's just go one more dimension, one, just one tiny bit more. And the answer is we don't know. Nobody knows the answer. So we, we don't even know what are the, I mean, there, we know a few equations. For example, Euler's equation that I show you for three dimensions has an extension for four dimensions and five dimensions, etc. But we don't have the equations necessary to completely characterize these vectors. Is the problem clear? We don't know. We don't even know what the equations could be. Is that bad? How little humanity knows about this? And it's just four dimensional. Four dimensional. Yes? Is the, is the open problem clear? All right. OK. Wake up. <laughs> so if you didn't understand anything I said about the first problem, let's talk about a different problem. Maybe you would like this more. Um, this is about the problem that very often, we want to see, mathematicians want to, want to be able to, to see in many dimensions. We want to be able to see in 20 dimensions, in 50 dimensions. We want to be able to have ideas of what happens in high dimensional objects. So how would you do visualization of high dimensional polytopes? There are many strategies. There are many strategies. By the way, every, every, uh, I must mention every picture that I'm going to put in the next few slides I would like to acknowledge comes from, from Thomas Banshoff, who is an emeritus professor here at Brown and one of the pioneers on visualization in mathematics. So he has done, been doing um, amazing work since the 1960s. Anyway, so let's, let's talk about his work. Yeah, so imagine you are two-dimensional. You have never seen three dimensions. You live in, in, the, in the floor, right? So how would you imagine something that is three-dimensional? Well, analogy. You need to make analogy somehow, right? So it's the same problem we have. We are three-dimensional. We don't know how it's like to be in four dimensions. So, but there is a way you can try to imagine for, uh, one higher dimension than, than, you, than you live in. And that is by, for example, projecting. You can do projections. Look at shadows. Let's look at the shadows of four-dimensional objects down into three dimensions. And I will show you here the analogy. Here is a three-dimensional object. Well, it's a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional object. So here it is. You see this picture? It's a th it's a, this is a, a prism, a, triang a triangle 
uh, base prism. Everybody see it? Is everybody with me? So this is the object. So what do I do? I use light. I put a, a, I put a lamp. I put a lamp on top of, a, of the triangle face here. And then I, I project it. I let the shadow of this object uh, fall to the floor. And you can see the shadow here. Everybody see that? This is the shadow of the three-dimensional object down into two dimensions. Everybody see that? Now, I show you already the pictures of the platonic solids. And the way I, I got these pictures was using shadows. This is, a, again, this, this, or some people call this a stereographic projection, right? It's a, it's a shadow. I call it a shadow. That's a very nice way to do it. So I want to ask you, what do you think this is a shadow of? This is, this is now supposed to be three, this is three dimensional. So this is a, a three, the three dimensional shadow of a four dimensional object. This is the, you, you know the cube. In three dimensions, we know the cube. We have seen the cube before. Here's the cube. In, this is a three dimensional cube. Of course, this is the two dimensional cube, which is just a square. So the, 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 three dim the four dimensional object, when I do the shadow of it, I get this picture. Everybody's with me? So this is, this is the shadow. And that's one very useful way to try to see in high, uh, something that is in four dimensions to see it in three dimensions. OK, but there's another way that I really, really like, because I have recently been working on this type of question, and this is slicing. So another way that you can ima imagine you have a watermelon, but you, you can only see you, you cannot, you are two-dimensional, so you cannot see the three-dimensional watermelon. So what should you do? Well, you slice the watermelon, right? You take slices of the watermelon, and then you kind of say, oh, you know, this, this looks like it could be like a, like a yeah, like a watermelon. <laughs> anyway, so, so here I'm showing you, this is the three-dimensional cube, the three-dimensional cube that everybody knows from school. And I'm showing you all the possible slices. There's five possible slices that you can get, let's say, up to, up to symmetry or up to trans the different polygons. I'm showing you all the different polygons that you can get by slicing a three-dimensional cube. So for example, here, you, so one of them here, let's, let me mark it. So you can, here you can get a, a square type of shape. Here you can get a rectangular sh shape. I mean, this, in some sense, these two are, for me, are the same because it's a polygon with four sides. Here, is a tr here are triangles. I can get triangles. I can get a pentagon. If, if, you're, if you are careful, you can uh, slice the cube and get a pentagon. Try it at home. You know, buy a piece of, of cheese. You can slice it, get a pentagon. And the, my favorite is you can get a hexagon here. Right? You can get a hexagon. So. A slicing is another way that you can try to visualize what is a, a high-dimensional object. So think about it. If you slice a three-dimensional object, what are the dimensions of the slices? They're two-dimensional. Now, if you slice a four-dimensional object, what are they going to be the slices? Three-dimensional, right? So the slices, your knife cuts through. I mean, for example, here I'm, I'm, I'm showing you how a knife is slicing the, the cube with this, and in depend, depending on the direction you slice, you get different shapes. For example, here, I'm, uh, in this direction, I get uh, kind of rectangular shapes. And then in this other direction, I get triangle, triangle, then hexagon, triangle, triangle. You see, it's a different, uh, it, it matters in which direction you slice. But I'm interested to, to know how many different shapes can I get? How many different shapes can I get? Yeah, so for how many different, uh, so how many different uh, polygons do I get when I slice a three-dimensional cube? I already told you the answer was what? Five, essentially, right? I mean, so these are slices. I'm showing you the slicing of a hypercube. This is, this is what you get when you slice a, a four-dimensional cube. So you get three-dimensional slices. For example, you get, you get uh, this, beautiful, this beautiful shape here is an octahedron. Right? And you have, uh, this is a, a tetrahedron, or, a, or like, like a triangular pyramid. So, but again, it matters what direction you take to slice. So here I get a, a, a hexagonal prism, a hexagonal prism. 
and uh, this is a triangular prism here. Yeah, so you get div different shapes. Is everybody with me? Does, do you understand what I'm doing? I'm, I'm studying objects in high dimension by doing slicings of, of it. Okay, so how many different shapes appear? I already told you that in dimension three, I have five possible polygons. Then in dimension four, I actually get 61 possible polytopes, 61. In dimension five, there's 484 possible polytopes. Okay, how about dimension six? Oh. <coughs> So if you slice the, the four-dimensional cube, then you get 61. And they are three-dimensional. Is that what you ask? No, for the five dimensions. Ah, for the five, oh, 484. Three dimensional. They, oh, they are four-dimensional. Yes, so thank you, yeah. So when you slice a five-dimensional object, you get the slices are four-dimensional. Yes, thank you. And there's 484 different ones. Okay, six dimension, nobody knows. So no, no person knows the answer to this. Okay, here's a question. How many different slices, can somebody come up with a formula tonight? Well, or maybe in a few weeks uh, for the number of different slices that the, every cube in dimension five, six, seven, etc., has when you slice it with, with planes, with hyperplanes. That's the question. We only know a few, a few data points, but that, that's all we know. And this, this gets very difficult. This, this becomes a very, very difficult problem. Is the problem clear? Yes? Is there even a question for us to solve No. Well, OK. Actually, yes, there's a, there's a bound. We have a bound for how many there has to be. And uh, yes, I, I can tell you the details of this bound. So we know a bound very recently, obtained at ISERM, actually. So, publicity for, for ISERM. <laughs> and, and of course, you can ask the same question for other polytopes. You know, for, take your favorite polytope and you can ask this question. All right. Okay, but I want to share with you what I think is the most beautiful, I mean, it's a very pretty way to visualize high dimensional polytopes by using a trick, right? And this is exactly what I was telling you when I, I, I go to elementary schools, I walk into an elementary school and I need to tell the kids something that is entertaining to them without, it, you know, without any background. And so you, I guarantee you, you can explain this to, to your children even if they are very young. Okay, here's the way to do things. So, so you, have a, you have a polytope, like, like the, it's, this is actually the, the decahedron again that I have here. And I give you scissors, right? Every, every, every kindergarten must have lots of scissors because they play with paper. So this is a great activity for teachers. If any of you is, is teacher, talk to me because this is really great for, for, for a classroom in kindergarten. So you, you take the scissors and you start cutting along the edges. So talk, 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 I cut, 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 and I open the thing. So this is a three-dimensional object, but when I cut it open, if, I, if I'm careful, I, I, again, I'm only allowed to cut through the edges, right, to the one-dimensional faces of this. So I take my object and I get something like this. Everybody see this? Can you see it? That's called a net. These things are called nets. So this is, these are two possible nets, two possible nets of the dodecahedron. So if I actually do this with scissors, I can open it in two different ways like this. So that's one, that's one question. OK, now I'm going to quiz the audience. What do you think this is? It's a cube. It's a three-dimensional cube. It's a very nice way to, re to visualize a three-dimensional cube. Is that the only way? No. I mean, in fact, let me ask you this question. How many ways are there to open the cube? I mean, the, for a three-dimensional cube, we know the answer, and I will let you figure it out as an exercise or you know, homework. But we don't know the answer for the n-dimensional cube. And what do I mean? You might say, what do you mean by the n-dimensional cube? Well, oh, sorry, I have one more picture of three dimensions. Here is, here is a, a, a three-dimension. What do you think this is? Anybody knows, maybe? It's a, thank you, very good. So this is an icosahedron. And, and this is actually, I don't remember the name, 
But this is a 15th century engraving, 15, uh, sorry, actually 16th century, 1525, something like that, by the famous artist Albrecht Du. I mean, some of you may, if you know your, your art history, you must have seen pictures by this uh, artist. So Albrecht Durer was fascinated by these nets. He was one of the first people that actually made nets. And uh, anyway, so let, but you can do this in dimension four. You can also do this in dimension four. Look, here is a net. Here is a net for the four-dimensional cube. Four-dimensional cube. Everybody's with me? Okay. Does anybody know the artist? So here's a famous painting by a very famous artist, Salvador Dali, exactly. So he used the, the net of the four dimensional cube to show this uh, very innovative uh, representation of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So that's, uh, yeah, anyway. So there's a lot of artists interested on this, right? A lot of artists interested on this. Is it clear what a net is? Very easy to explain. Okay, open problem. Nobody knows the answer to this problem, and this problem was presented first in writing in the in 1970s by Shepard. So this is known as the Shepard uh, question or the Shepard conjecture. So if you are not careful, if you are not careful, and you cut, 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 and you open it flat, and you put it on the paper, what may happen is that there are bad overlappings. So for example here, you see this overlaps badly, you see? Or like in here it's very obvious that when you flatten it, um, you know, it's, it's bad in the printing, right? Everybody see that? So, but that's only if you're not careful. If I, if I was careful with these same examples, I can cut in a different way and I will always be able to open it in these examples. But nobody knows whether this is possible for every polytope in three dimensions. So you might actually find someday, when you're playing with this, uh, an example of a polytope with, I don't know, with 50 faces, that no matter how you open it, you will have these bad overlappings. Yes? Is the problem clear? I really like this problem because, you know, when I was a child, I, I, I don't know if, if here is easy to get, but you can buy, uh, I mean, I used to be able to buy a lot of pictures like this where you build the polyhedron, right? So you get a picture, you get one of these, and you cut it, and you build the polytope. And I do that with kids. I mean, I do that a lot with kids in elementary schools. I really like to do that because they are fierce. I mean, they, 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 don't, they don't know f uh, fear. They really like mathematics. They are, you know, they just like it. They just try to experiment. And that's the right spirit that we should have, all have with mathematics. So what is very interesting is that I, on purpose, sometimes be, bring this without instructions. And I just tell the kids, here is the paper, build it for me. And two kids build it, and they get different answers from the same, piece, I mean, same model. Is that possible? Yes, it's possible. So that's another thing that is very nice about these, these types of problems that shows the students or the little kids that there's no unique right answer in math, which is another thing that we have it's just so bad. We always say, oh, this is the right answer. You didn't use the right method. No, that's not the way we think in mathematics. It's, it's kind of, the idea is to have fun. Everybody's with me? All right. Yeah, so let's see. Yeah, so this is the, the next problem. Every, is everybody happy? Yes. Yes, yeah, so thank you for your question. So to, to get a net, you essentially need to cut a spanning tree of the graph. That's essentially what you need to do. Uh, I didn't want to get in those technical details, but that's exactly what you need to do. So essentially, the number of nets is bounded by above, for the experts, uh, is bounded above by the number of spanning trees of the graph, yes. But, um, but, but not all of them will work, as I, I'm showing here, right? Okay. Wake up. If you didn't understand anything I said, you have another chance to catch up. So, all right. So here's, here's number three. Number three is triangulation. So if I have a, if, I mean, all of you know 
that if I have a polygon, I mean, this is something that you can play with as a child. I draw, you draw a polygon, and you can cut it into triangles. I mean, I'm showing you one way to, to cut this polygon into triangles. So that's what I call a triangulation. So you have a, a polytope, and I want to cut it into triangles. Now, when I go in dimension three, four, etc., I cannot just use triangles. I have to use something more, which are called simplices. So simplices are polytopes that look like triangles. They're built with triangles. So one is, you know, the edge is a simplex, then I have triangles, then I have tetrahedra, and the higher dimensional analogs of them. And they're super important in everything we do. For example, here, uh, I'm showing you pictures of all the possible ways to divide into triangles a hexagon. There are 14, 14 different ways, um, oops, sorry, 14 different ways to decompose a hexagon into triangles, okay? But uh, here on the, on, the, on the right, I'm showing you all the different ways that you have to divide into tetrahedra a three-dimensional cube. For example, one of my favorites is right here. Uh, this, this one is, uh, so let me use this. So I really like this, this one because it's the smallest number of tetrahedra. It has only five tetrahedra. So, um, so you here you have, in the center you see there's a, there's a central tetrahedron and then you chop off every other corner that gives you four more tetrahedra and that together decomposes the cube into pieces that are tetrahedra shaped. Everybody see that? And for example, here is another one that has six. I will, yeah, this one has, uh, no, this one has six, and so on. So the, you, can, you, you can trust me, <laughs> this, there's are all possible ways. But again, we don't know, if you now tell me the four, we only know dimension two. I mean, dimension two, I can do it right here. The number of triangulations of the two-dimensional cube are ju there's just two of them. There's one, right? One and two. That's it, right? There's nothing else. But three dimensions, we know the answer. Four dimensions, we know the answer, but we don't know the answer for five dimensions. This is a very difficult thing to compute. Okay. Okay, I'm, I, but I want to tell you something in three dimensions that is kind of fascinating to me and to many experts for at least uh, 20 years we have been thinking about this problem. So he, I'm showing you here a picture of, a, of a two pyramids glued together. So this is a double pyramid. It's a double pyramid. The base of this pyramid is a hexagon that you see there. So here it is. So here's the hexagonal shape. And I put two pyramids on, on, on top of each other, more or less, right? I mean, one below and one on the top. Now, I'm showing you two different ways to break this pyramid, this bipyramid, into, into tetrahedra. So the first way is like an orange. The first way, this is what I call an orange here, because you see the, the tetrahedra go around, go around, I, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see the red? So there's a red edge in the center. And if you join this red edge with this other edge, you get a tetrahedron, right? This, this and this make a tetrahedron. Uh, but if I go around, I get six tetrahedra, right? So this is a way to decompose this double pyramid with six tetrahedra. But there's another way to do it. You can also decompose um, you know, four tetrahedra on top and four tetrahedra on the bottom, and then you glue them together, and that gives you eight tetrahedra, OK? Now, I'm going to leave it to you as an exercise. You can do it with seven. It's not, it's, it's not as easy as it, as it seems. It's a nice puzzle to give to your children when, they go in the, when you go in the car for a long drive. <laughs> so that's what I used to torment my children with. So anyway, so you give, you give, yeah, anyway, you, you will find one with seven, I guarantee you. Now, but here's the question that nobody knows, nobody knows the answer for. In three dimensions, it's a three-dimensional problem in geometry that nobody knows the answer for. So imagine that you tell me you have a polytope that has a triangulation with K1 tetrahedra and another one with K2 tetrahedra. Is it true that there is a triangulation of every size in between? You know, like in this example, if I have one with six and one with eight, there has to be one with seven. Yeah? 
Everybody understand the question? We don't know whether this is true or false. We don't know whether this is true or false. It's a very simple question. It has been, in some sense, this, we know this is false in dimension, the first time we know is false, or similar question is false is in dimension six. But already in dimension three, we don't know the answer. So often, it's ironic, but often in mathematics, the, the most difficult problems are in, in dimensions three and four. Somehow, Ge geometry in dimensions three and four are really difficult. Sometimes people find, ex find examples in high dimension very quickly, but not in dimension three. Is the problem clear? Yeah, so, okay. Wake up again. So this time I want to reflect a little bit on the fact that people say, well, I love mathematics. Mathematics is very beautiful, but it's useless. It's not gonna help me. It's not gonna, it has nothing to do with my life, okay? And I found this quote. So I claim that polytons are not just beautiful, but they're useful. So I found this quote that uh, really, I take this as personal to me. I mean, you can read it. It, the quote is by some, some student in some high school, I'm not going to say where, that said you know, he, that the, he, wa he or she was studying systems of linear inequalities. As you already know from the beginning of my lecture, polytops are systems of linear inequalities. That's what they are, right? So he, this person was studying polytops, and, and she go, he or she goes and says, well, uh, yeah, but most people will never use in their life. Yeah. Okay, so it says, I asked my eighth grade math teacher, when are we, we are going to use these? And she said, um, you aren't. Okay, well, I was kind of very, very disappointed by this because I think this is some incredible opportunity to tell kids why math is useful. It's actually an incredibly good opportunity because we can show them something they are learning is directly related to their, to their life, and I'm gonna try to tell you why. So next time somebody tells you, give me an example where, I, where math is used in real life, I'm gonna show you right here, right now. Okay, so this has to do with computers. So there's, right now, here in ISERM, there's a six month program of researchers from all over the world talking about something called discrete optimization. And when we solve discrete optimization problems, we rely on a workhorse. We rely on a very important problem, which we call linear optimization, linear programming. So what is that? So you have a polytop, which is the set of solutions of a system of equations. So you have one of these guys, maybe in dimension 43 or dimension 50 or 200,000. But you want to find the point in this polytope that maximizes a linear function. That's what you would like to do. The value of this function is maximized. So, and, uh, and this is a very, very important problem. I'm gonna try to argue why. So when you try, okay, here's a, a situation that is exactly a linear optimization problem. This is the transportation problem that comes in the following way. You have cities and factories uh, so here are factories in the state of Rhode Island that produce milk. I don't know, so this city, I mean, this factory in Rhode Island produces 108 million gallons of milk. I don't know if that's realistic, but anyway. <laughs> so there's a lot of milk in Rhode Island. And then you have uh, this city in Rhode Island. I don't know, that's Newport. Maybe they drink a lot of milk in Newport. You know, 220,000 gallons of milk. Anyway, so the, every city has some demand of milk, and every factory produces some amount of milk, and you're supposed to give the milk from this factory to the city. But of course, if you send the, the, you know, you send the, the milk in this, uh, in this highway, I don't know, it's maybe coming from far away, so it's gonna cost you some amount of money, so maybe it's gonna cost you CIJ. CIJ is the amount of money it's gonna cost you to send milk from factory I to city J, right? So when you, when you tell, you want to, when you're a, the manager of this company, so you want to minimize the cost. So how do you do that? Well, you have to take this, minimize, you want to minimize the sum 
of the costs by the amounts of milk you sent, right? See, if I call Xij, the amount of milk that I sent from factory I to CTJ, I'm minimizing that. That's a linear, linear optimization, and this is a polytope. This is actually a polytope that I'm representing in the shape of a network. Are you with me? Okay, now this is very classical. I'm just showing you an example, but we want to solve this in real life. In fact, let me just say, this, is, this simple problem that I'm showing you got the Nobel Prize in economics in 1970s because it's so important that people actually study this in economics, right? Um, anyway, okay, so now computers need to be used to solve these problems because, I mean, I'm not gonna start solving this type of, you know, if I'm UPS, think about UPS or DHL, they don't have one factory, you know, they, they don't have four factories, they don't have four cities, they are gonna have thousands or thousands of these deliveries to be made, right? So how do you solve such things by hand? You cannot, you need computers. So when you have computers, you need mathematicians to teach the computers to do these algorithms, to solve these problems, right? Now this gentleman, smiling gentleman that is here is George Danzig. In the 1940s, he was working for the Air Army during the Second World War, and you know, doing war is also difficult. So, so he was helping actually with the logistic planning of the US Army, and he was asked to solve such problems. I believe the diet of the soldiers was the first thing they needed to plan. Anyway, so he invented, he invented the simplex method. So it's an algorithm, it's a computer algorithm that many people in this room, I mean, many of the experts, colleagues that are here study this, this problem. And you know, normally I teach this in college. I teach it in about five, six weeks, but I'm gonna, you li I like you so much, I'm gonna make you a discount, I'm gonna teach it to you in two minutes. <laughs> so, okay, so here it is. So, okay, we already know, we already know that the set of possible solutions is a polytope. So it's one of these things. So, and, uh, so what, what George Danzig realized is that if there is an optimal solution, it has to be at a corner. There has to be a corner that has solution. If there is a solution, an optimal solution, there's one that is at a corner, one of zero dimensional vertices. So what, what Danzig said is, okay, good. So I started, I started one of these vertices, for example, maybe start here. And if I find a way to improve, I find a, an edge, a one dimensional face that I can make it better, the value of my function, I just go down. I'm just going downhill, right? It's just natural. If you let a ball go downhill, it's gonna go to the end of the hill, right? So that's kind of his idea. So he starts walking. So here's a, here's a vertex, and he walks and walks and walks. And again, the, he, I mean, again, I'm simplifying everything, but he has to tell the, the, the computer how to decide because there might be many edges to choose from, right? So he, he explains how to do that. And um, essentially, when you are, finally you reach the bottom, when you reach the bottom, well, there's no way to go, right? There's nowhere else to go, so you have reached the optimal solution and you're done. Now that's the way you should sh send the milk. Is that the idea, is the idea clear? Again, I'm simplifying a lot, but this is the geometric picture of what happens with the simplex algorithm. Okay, now we use this algorithm all the time. I mean, I will, I will dare to say, has, has anybody here never been on an airplane? I guess everybody has been on an airplane at least once, good. Well, if you have been on an airplane, maybe you had a bad experience, maybe somebody lost your luggage or something, but, but I will say the following. Airlines need the simplex method to plan all kinds of things, crew scheduling, um, you know, planning the routes, of the airline, of the planes, everything, just absolutely every, op every operation. Actually, we have a colleague here that works for Air, for Air France. I mean, like he collaborates with people in Air France. So yeah, mathematics is absolutely indispensable for travel, especially large scale travel. UPS needs mathematicians, right? I mean, to plan, I mean, to do, when you do logistic planning in such a large scale, there's no other way. You have to use these algorithms, right? Now, this algorithm 
was nominated one of the top 10 most influential computer algorithms in, in the 20th century because we use it so much. We use it all the time. Now, here is the thing that I will tell you, and you will, you will probably say, what? Well, even though we use it all the time, we do not understand it. We do not understand how really perfectly works. I mean, the reason is we would like to know how many steps can the algorithm take to get to the optimal solution. We would like to have a bound, to have a prediction. Yeah, when you really understand a system, when you really understand something, you can make predictions. You can say, well, it's going to take no more than 10 steps and it's going to be there. Right? It's like if I tell you, uh, well, I know a way to get to Boston in, in just 10 minutes. But I don't tell you how, or I don't tell you why. I mean, it's like you don't trust me, right? So it's the same reason why we would like to, <laughs> we would like to understand the simplex method. So I myself and my PhD students have actually been working a lot on trying to understand the simplex algorithm. So, and there's something fundamental that we need to understand. So we are walking on the graph of this polytope. So this is the polytope, and we are walking on this graph. We would like to know. Um, how many steps does it take? And now the problem is that when you have a graph like this, what does it mean to measure the steps? Well, you go from one place to the other. There are many paths. There are many paths, but I'm looking for the shortest path, for the shortest possible path. And that's the distance from one point to the other. And then I want to, to measure what's the worst that can happen. Over all possible pairs of points, I take the maximum distance between these points, and I would like to get, get a bound. Okay, so that's what we call the diameter of the graph. So we would like to measure, a, we would like, the big open problem that nobody knows how to answer here is uh, it's an open question again, so since 1947. Is there a good bound for the diameter of the uh, the graph in terms of the number of facets, right? The number of facets and the number of the and the dimension. So these two parameters is something we would like to understand. Okay. So I'm showing you some bounds we know, some bounds we know here, uh, but they are not very nice. I will, I can tell tell you later if you want to understand why. But we don't know the best bounds. The best best kind of bound will be something that is just a polynomial. In, in school, you learn polynomials because they are very nice. And we would like to have polynomial bounds. These are not polynomials because there are logarithms. So for example, there's a logarithm here, and there's a, an, you know, there's a, a exponential function here. So we don't like that kind of stuff. OK. Um, yeah, so there was a lot of conjecture of how many steps is possible. Some people said the, num the correct answer for this bound is number of facets minus the dimension. Uh, this, is believe this was believed since 1957 by, uh, this was a conjecture known as the Hirsch conjecture. And uh, somebody was asking me about dimensions higher than four. Well, in 19 2010, uh, Francisco Santos, a Spanish mathematician, found a 43-dimensional counterexample. So for the first time, we found something that does not work, n minus d is not the bound. It's in 43 dimensions. So imagine it was hard for, for, to understand how to see four dimensions. Imagine how hard it is to understand 43 dimensions. But yeah, again, so this is one of the big open questions. There's actually a million dollars, so you can be rich and famous at the same time if you know how to find the, the answer to this problem. Um, I think I have just one minute left, so let me just go to the, to the conclusions. I have more stuff to tell you, many, many open problems, but yeah, I don't want to go over time. That's bad manners. Uh, uh, yeah, so I think polytopes are very good ambassadors of mathematics. I mean, at least maybe I love them so much because I use them all the time. Um, they're beautiful, but they're useful too. I mean, beauty and utility don't have to be excluded, right? Exclusive of, of each other. They, as I just told you, polytopes are used to make decisions in real life operations, like you know, airline operations and things like that. So they're very important. And now the other thing, I would, I would like to leave you with a homework. So when you go to Thanksgiving dinner with your relatives, you should try to convince them that math is beautiful and useful. So try to find your favorite way to do that. 
I encourage you to try, if you like mathematics, try to find a way to convince your relatives that don't know that math is, is so, so wonderful, that why math is so wonderful. Thank you sir, very much for your time. Okay, uh, <laughs> I, I think, uh, okay, let's start with the Hirsch conjecture. I, I believe the Hirsch conjecture, uh, so, okay, I believe that the answer to this question, is there a bound with a polynomial, that the answer is yes. I believe that the answer is yes. And in fact, I, I can tell you what Pell polynomial I think is the correct answer, but uh, that's a different story. Uh, um, about, uh, let's see, uh, let's see, what are the other problems I, I mentioned? The triangulation, this triangulation problem, I actually believe is false. That there will, we will someday found, find a, a polytope, large, I mean, three-dimensional, but la with large enough number of vertices where the triangulations will not have, there will be gaps on the triangulation sizes. Yeah, I believe this is probably false. We just haven't been able to do it. Um, the number of triangulations of the cube. Let me say something about the number of triangulations of the cube. This is one of the, computationally most difficult problems I have ever met in my life. There was a famous mathematician that said that if a group of aliens came and asked us to do certain computations, it, they were so hard that we should destroy the aliens rather than try to do the computations. And I think this is one of them. This is really a very difficult problem. Um, yeah, so I, th I, I, I really have no clue. What, I mean, I guess this is, I'm asking you for a number in this case, not really a Yes, no answer, but uh, yeah, finding the correct number is very, very difficult. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, yeah, actually this one I believe is true. I think the, the problem for little, uh, and, and if you ask little kids, like children in kindergarten, whether they believe this is true, they say yes, it's always possible. And they always try, to, they give you arguments. It's so fascinating, I really love it. With little children, they, they believe they can do it. Somehow when we're adults, we lose the, you know, the, we don't believe in ourselves somehow. Uh, anyway, uh, let's see. More problems, what was the other one? Ah, yeah, the, the, actually this, this one is very, very hard, the one of dimension, uh, oh, the number of uh, the slices, right, the slices. Again, a very difficult computational problem, as you know. She has worked on this with me, too. Uh, um, yes, and finally, the, the, the question of the four, characterizing the four dimensional vectors. I think another 100 years are going to pass. I'm not going to get to see this uh, resolved, probably. It's very difficult. Yeah, we, you know, just going up one more dimension, I don't think. I don't think it's going to happen in the next 100 years. Because there's so many we, not, we don't know. We don't even have a good guess of what the equations describing these objects will be. Yeah, I think those are where the main problems I presented. So. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yes. So is the day that ICERN gets a fully functioning quantum computer, is that the day you're going to have solutions to all these problems? Is, is it a <laughs> question of computing power largely? Oh, well, certainly, OK, yes, OK. There are some things that are certainly will benefit from computational power. For example, the question that I propose on the number of slices of the cube, different slices of the, of the n-dimensional cube, Having a fast, let's, let's, not, let's not even say quantum specifically. Imagine there's a new technology we don't even know yet, but it's 10 times faster. These problems will benefit from that, for sure. But there are other types of problems in mathematics that even with more computational power, we might not be able to really understand enough to answer them. And I believe this is one of them, um, um, this one. The, four the characterization of the four-dimensional one. Because we, even so primitive, qu basic questions, we will not be able to really answer uh, unless we have some insight. We need, I think we need more than, in even, even with artificial intelligence, you know, we will need more, more intuition in the geometry and really insights and creativity to come up with what is the right answer. To even try to prove this is the right answer. Yeah. 
So I, I, I come from a very different, different background, uh, so in other uh, fields of math. And when I see one of these questions, for example, the number of shapes that appear, I have absolutely no idea what kind of tool you can use to tackle even that question. If you were to ask me, I had absolutely no idea to use algebraic geometry. To use ah, what kind okay. of tools? <laughs> how would you even approach? Well, uh, thank you for your question. So the, the question of the slicing, uh, I can tell you that you need to use every polytope, every polytope, let's say the cube, has a space of all possible slices. And that has a, a beautiful structure. And that's how you can approach these types of problems. It's essentially a paper that is coming off from ICERN uh, that, uh, that is allows you to say, oh, the cube is, the slices of the cube are not just random. They, they have a, a beautiful organized structure. And once you find this, once you see this beautiful structure, oh, that's how I can count them. Because you can kind of walk on the space. I am a strong believer that finding a structure on problems is the right way to solve the problems in many cases. Um, yeah, I mean, and again, what type of math you are going to need to solve the questions Sometimes we don't know yet. In, in 50 years, somebody's going to say, oh, you really needed probability. Oh, yeah, OK, thank you. Now I know. But I mean, in this particular case, we have recently written a, a paper where we know, understand more or less the structure of all the possible slices, fortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? How much uh, study is going into how children use the polyhedron? Thank you. Yeah, so there are several mathematicians, educators, that have um, dedicated their careers to bring polyhedra to teach students because it really inspired the, the, the kids to be in, in love with, with geometry, right? So for example, uh, Doris Schatz Snyder, she has wonderful books and uh, dedicated for teachers. I mean, we, I, I think, Teacher education is one of the most important things we can do in this country, in my opinion, because if, if teachers are well trained and well supported, they can do marvelous things. And uh, I think uh, Doris has worked a lot on creating materials for classrooms uh, that are really wonderful, and they s inspire the kids to keep learning mathematics, essentially, to, to, ask, to find fun that is fun, that is not boring and scary, and that they shouldn't be hating mathematics, right? So th there's some wonderful work. I can give you some references. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, what does the path from Euler to, to Steinitz look like? So like, you know, did Steinitz, did this problem just sort of sit around for, you know, a couple of hundred years and Steinitz picked it up? Or were people plugging away at it unsuccessfully? Thank you. That's, uh, that I'm glad you asked this question. So mathematics, some, see, this is one thing I'm very happy you asked this question, Christine. Often mathematicians appear to the public like these crazy geniuses that, oh, I got this idea, and uh, they run and write the solution, right? That's far from the truth. In this case of the Euler equation, certainly there were many mathematicians saying things that were sometimes very insightful, sometimes they were very wrong. For example, I think definitely the equations that you saw, I mean, there are only three equations we need, right? Or three conditions. Yeah, it's very simple conditions. The most difficult part of proving this theorem is actually constructing them. Constructing, so in other words, you tell me a, a group of numbers, like uh, the number uh, 20, 30, 12. 20, 30, 12 is, well, you know, is the, the sequence of numbers of the dodecahedron, right? But suppose you didn't know that. Then how do I construct such an object, right? So Steinitz figured out a procedure to do this, but many other people had ideas of how to go about that before him. In fact, if you believe in the, I mean, if you're interested in the philosophy of mathematics, uh, you might, be, you might know that we mathematicians are different from chemists or from physicists because we like to believe that our truth is more, is more deep than the truth of other sciences, right? We, the proof, mathematical proof is eternal in some sense, right? But there's a very famous book of, of a mathematical philosopher, Lakatos, where he spends 
100 pages analyzing the proof of this theorem, exactly this theorem, because for many years, so as Euler wrote a proof in 1777, no? So he wrote a proof. But somebody comes and says, no, 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 Euler was wrong. This is not correct. So somebody else comes and fixes what he, they think is a mistake. And I guarantee you, in 50 years, modern what we are modern mathematicians, somebody else is going to come, oh, these people are idiots. They don't know how to write things, right? They, they, there's a constant renovation of mathematics. I mean, mathematics is alive. It's a human activity, and it becomes evolves like human society. And I think the proofs of this, now we accept them and teach them to undergraduate students maybe, but, but they do evolve, and it took 100 years to get there. So I think they all, to get to this new solution, maybe it will take 200, but we will get there so, someday. But as a propagation, yeah? you said it's a human activity, but are there examples of artificial intelligence knocking out problems or, or sort of changing the way people are thinking about the questions? Thank you for that question. So recently, the, I mean, to me, the most spectacular one, and maybe other colleagues know better examples, but the most spectacular example I have seen is a recent breakthrough using artificial intelligence in, in topology. So the, uh, topology is a part of mathematics that studies shapes. So the, the, what the artificial intelligence did is essentially use the data and recommend an equation to mathematicians. And then the artificial intelligence did not provide a proof that this is correct. The humans did it, but the fact that they, there was this collaboration between humans and computers, essentially to discover the theorem, and then the humans kind of prove the theorem, I think this is the future, in my opinion. I mean, a lot of things are going to change, in my opinion. I mean, maybe I'm saying something controversial here, but I think artificial intelligence will help us more. Automatic theorem proving will help us a lot more. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> well, okay. First of all, let me say the following. You are not going to be out of a job. Because I think, actually, when there's more need to, to when, when more computer power will come, when, you know, artificial intelligence, quantum computers, like you were asking. So when other tools come to the field, it's far from true that, oh, now my, I don't have a job. It's quite the opposite, in my, in my experience. I think you, you now need more mathematicians to put all these tools together. You know, it's like you have musical instruments, but if you don't have, you don't have who play the musical instruments, there's no music, right? I think math is definitely, I mean, humans will still do mathematics. If you want, it's like uh, artificial mathematics because they need, will need to use these tools to do better and farther away things. But I think we still will, you know, we will still be necessary. Oh. Last one, yeah. Oh. Good examples of proof of the Kepler conjecture. Oh, thank you. Yes. So, I mean, so it's established that it is a correct proof. Yes. The proof is correct. But I think most mathematicians think, okay, there's got to be a better way to do this. Yeah, it's true. So, the, so my colleague here, Kurt, is say, mentioning that there was a proof of, the, of a famous conjecture of Kepler about the best way to stack oranges in the supermarket. Uh, I can tell you more about that if later. Uh, but that conjecture was proven essentially with computers, using, com using linear programming, actually, using linear programming. So, but, so there's some controversy in the community, of course. Is, what is a proof, right? Is, is it legal to use pro uh, machines to, to do proofs? It's maybe students, young people will ask, is it legal to use ChatGPT to do my homework? You know, <laughs> similar thing. Uh, anyway, so I, I think uh, there's, these kinds of proofs will come more and more often, in my opinion, yeah. That, that we will use machines, automatic theorem proving, artificial intelligence, quantum computers, et cetera. We'll do more and more and more.